I couldn't have painted my pictures without Cubism very much in the background. So it arises out of a realistic impulse, but the way the pictures are constructed doesn't necessarily end up realistically because the studies that are used during the making of it often come out of collages, which the Cubists used extensively. So some people lazily say, oh, your work is abstract. What they mean is it isn't photorealist. But to me, it isn't abstract. I've painted very few abstract pictures. They usually got a subject. And you'll find looking at the work that the subject is quite obsessive very often, that there are 50 variations on the same theme, 50 cattle grids or 50 bridges or 50 pyramids. So it's very much like a musician getting a theme in his mind and working a series of variations upon it from something that may start off very realistic to a final work that you may not even be able to see what it is, but you would if you followed the process. I take an awful long time in a picture to get certain textures and detail in the handling of paint, which I think is owed, uh, owes a lot to Braque, Chardin, Vermeer. These are painters who put an awful lot of time into individual pictures. I always drew as a child, and I probably drew more extensively than most children in using different materials, Indian ink and so on, which all children wouldn't have done. But I was given my first box of paints, oil paints, when I was 11. And when I look back, they must have thought I was very interested to give me oil paints as an 11-year-old, which is a bit unusual. So I painted my first oil paintings on an oil sketching paper when I was 11. The first purpose-built studio I got was under a church in uh, York in the 1970s. I'd worked in a spare room in Nigeria. I'd worked in a spare box room as a child. We had a big house because it was a manse and my father was a minister and we always had plenty of room. So even as a 15-year-old, I had my own studio room. And then a cottage in North Wales, which was, had a guest bedroom, but was almost entirely a studio, a room for framing and a big knocked through ground floor space for painting. And as the space increased, the size of the pictures increased. Very often the process will begin because it's what's left over from the previous picture. So you've thought that the previous picture is addressing perhaps a doorway in the centre or a barrier going across the centre or a glimpse of sea in the centre and you think this picture you've just worked on is going to capture it and it never does. There's always something that escapes you. So very often it will begin as a variation on the previous one. I have boxes and boxes in my studio of bits of cut paper from coloured magazines, advertisements and so on. And this is like a paint box of coloured paper. And I will often get certain pieces of paper out and just play with them and rearrange them. With something in mind, but the papers themselves have a large element of chance in which form they fall and whether one's slightly to the left or to the right because they're not stuck down. And this will suggest variations. And now, since digital photography came in, I will photograph that collage all the way through its processes before it's finally stuck down. So I might have six variations on that collage. I might use variation number two for a painting and variation number seven for a painting because I can have my cake and eat it. In the old days, you had to fix on one. Now you've got almost too much choice. I use photography a lot in my work. I, I, I'm a nightmare to be on holiday with. If I'm walking 
along a beach or through a city, I might take 50 pictures in 50 minutes. I'm constantly seeing things. I might print those, work on them on the computer, and they might suggest future work. Uh, that's just a way of bypassing the need to spend an hour with a sketchbook. I wouldn't gain that much by drawing direct from life for the type of work I do. So very often I'm going from a pastel study to a collage, to a small oil, to a larger oil, and the final one might not look like the smaller work that sparked it, but if you saw them side by side you would see that the development is clear. If I didn't surprise myself, there'd be no point in doing it. Very often, if I'm doing an oil that is fairly similar to its collage study, it might look as if I'm simply copying it. And that's just a mechanical process of measuring it up and making it four times bigger. The process of making it is to discover something you didn't know before you began. If you're just saying what you already know, it'll be tired. Something in your paint, on your palette, or some piece of paper in a collage can come from totally from left field and bring a completely unthought of element into your work. And all you can do then is salute it and say thank you. It's come from a realm that wasn't mentally intended. It's a gift to you. The language of Cubism, which developed in the early years of the 20th century, I feel is a language that's not been fully exploited. It often amazes me what trivial ends some of the Cubists put that wonderful language to. I find that I want to deal with matters of life and death, which is why there are cemeteries in my work, as well as the passage from the world to the world beyond in a more subtle way. I want to use the language developed out of Cubism to express things that you, in the old days you would have thought only Rembrandt or Michelangelo or Raphael would have tackled, which are religious questions, the nature of being. The other thing that's a huge part of my thought is that I give as much time and read as much on physics and cosmology as I do about art history. And I'm very interested in the nature of reality, of what things are made out of, the structure of things. And my works are not realistic depictions of the outer appearance of things, but the relationships between things. So the spaces between objects in my work, between a gate and the sky, are just as important as the, what you would think of as the objects. So you will find often in my work that the sky has an edge. It doesn't just drift to the edge of the canvas. The sky is bounded with a frame. And that's because I think of the skyness of the sky as something that stops and starts in flux. And in the way that the CERN accelerator in Switzerland is trying to examine what the nature of matter and reality is, I think an artist of my type is trying to configure what things are made of, what things are permanent, what things are fleeting, the exchange between things. And this is best illustrated by my pyramids. You'll see a series of pictures there with the four elements. The, the pyramid is made out of stone and I paint it made out of water. It's standing on earth, and my earth is sky. So the water pyramid is standing on the sky. The sky that's behind the stone is stone. So the thing that's least material is the most densely material. And in one or two of them, then the fourth element, fire, creeps in. And the reflection of one of them in the water becomes fire. This comes entirely out of my view of the nature of physical reality, which physicists would agree with, that it's in a constant dance of flux, which the Indian 
Hindu artist understood perfectly there was a dance going on between things and non-things and that's what I'm trying to explore in my work. The fact that I'm Welsh, I think, is not something I think of day in, day out, consciously. But I think a lot of the themes in my work, I recognise resonances with Welsh mythology, Celtic mythology. I'm very concerned with the transition from one world to the other, and the sense of a Celtic underworld and a beyond is there throughout my work. Uh, I could illustrate it by the difference between the gates in my work based on quarry gates or bridges which form horizontal barriers in the Welsh work and the cattle grids that open out that uh, barrier into the world beyond. So in recent work in the last decade, works called Deaths and Entrances which often have a central dark doorway in the centre. I'm concerned with passing from here to there. The picture behind me, this large blue cattle grid, is a perfect example of this. The signpost on the painting even says that it's here and there. It says uh, world's end and you can see that the runner is making a transition across a, what the Buddhists call a no-gate barrier from one realm to the other. And the cattle grid stood to me for the threshold between here and there, which could be the threshold between life and death. And I think this is quite, it's obviously a Christian preoccupation, but I think it's more mythic Welsh Celtic preoccupation. Although my work is on the internet, you gain an enormous amount from seeing the physical nature of the work. I make my own boards, so it has a particular texture. There's nearly always a colour bleeding through from the back. The underpainting is done in quite different colours from the final painting. So the textures, where the paint is thin, where it's thick, can only be appreciated with you standing in front of it and giving it time. I think you, the time you put into a piece of work is there for the observer to get out of it. And although I might obsess over, for hours over a particular small area of a painting, and somebody overlooking might think, well, why, why does it matter that that angle's there or that that texture is on that piece of red? Something about my dwelling on it is there for you to extract. And I use a phrase about my work that my work has a dense intendedness. That could look constricting, that I'm too analytical and putting too much thought and not leaving enough room for spontaneous gestures. But I'm a great believer that I pack the work very, very densely and tightly so you can, as an observer, can unravel it over a long period of time. I don't think my works give up their meaning quickly. They don't form an immediate sensation. Whereas a lot of art since the Second World War and a lot of young British artists' art, it's no accident that their famous exhibition at the Royal Academy was called Sensation. And that art is about hitting you between the eyes with a sucker punch. And Tracy Emming's bed or a Damien Hirst cow or shark makes an immediate impression, but I'm not sure that you get much more out of it ten hours later than you do 
from the initial punch that it gives you. And I'm not e at ease myself with hitting somebody between the eyes and grabbing them by the lapels without having a follow-up to say to them. So I want my work to endure technically. I put an awful lot of technical effort into the way it's painted, the way the supports are made, the way it's framed, so it will last. But I do that in the way that I think Shakespeare wrote his sonnets because we're trying to make something that outlasts our being here. And the Elizabethans, because life was cheap and life was short, are absolutely obsessed with their legacy and what they're going to leave behind, and so am I. I am prone to periods of inactivity and depression. That might be helped if I'd had more success. In the moments of doubt, which I get, if you knew that three people had written monographs on your work, you'd had ten retrospectives in New York, Paris, London, Moscow and things, you would think, oh well, I have achieved something. But ultimately I'm not dependent on that for my sense of success. I look at my work fairly objectively, I think, and I idolise so many great painters that I'm always times measuring myself up against what I consider very high standards. So I hope I'm not delusional in my view of the worth of my own work. If I think of what success might represent, it would be people giving the work time, coming back to it more than once, it mattering to them um, in the way that you might learn a poem when you're in school and it's there with you for the rest of your life. Every time you walked through and saw a doorway, a gateway, a cattle grid, uh, an apse in a church, you would see it differently because you've seen my work. I think one day it will have its audience, the work. And I could waste an awful lot of painting or writing time promoting myself. And every day promoting myself is a day not painting. Because I don't paint a commission, I'm following the dictates of my own psyche as I'm weaving my way through my work. And therefore, the response from other people wouldn't either encourage or stop me from doing it. I obviously wish I had more people seeing it, principally because I want the work to be looked after. If I had more recognition and more fame, the work would be more valuable. People bought it, even if they moved house or sold it, they would make sure they got something for it and they would look after it. The danger of being not so well known is they might throw it into a skip because there's no value in it. That's a terrifying thought. But that's the area where people's response matters. <laughs>